गुड इवनिंग स्टूडेंट्स वेलकम टू द सेशन यस सो बी वर्क ऑन दी अपील्स एंड रिविजन गुड इवनिंग नम्रता यस सो बी वर ऑन दी अपील्स एंड रिविजन पोर्शन राइट सो आई जस्ट क्विकली रिकैप वॉट वी हैव डन इन द लास्ट क्लासेस वी हैव डन दी rectification under 154 which i told you if there is any mistake apparent from record concerning any order which is passed under the act can be any order assessment order any other order intimation under 1431 or tds tcs intimation mistake apparent from record is the glaring mistake apparent mistake which is not to be found out by digging into the order any subsequent decision of supreme court or any retrospective amendment would also constitute the mistake apparent from record time limit for making the rectification is 6 months from the date of application in case the application for rectification is made by assc in case it's a sua motu rectification carried out by the income tax authority it is 4 years from the financial year in which the order is passed and if the tax is enhanced or if the refund is reduced then the opportunity of being heard will be given to the assc but if the tax is enhanced then the notice of demand will follow and this can be appealed before the cit appeals or jcit then the another option that the assc has is revision under 264 the revision can be application can be made to the pccit ccit pcit or cit to revise the order passed by the subordinate authority application is to be made within one year from the date of order the authorities can of course condone the delay and the revision order has to be passed by them within one year this order will be final no appeal will lie against this particular order then is the appeal to cit appeal or jcit appeal under 246a or 246 the appealable orders i told you it's intimation under 1431 assessment order under 1433 or 147 or 144 then the tds tcs intimation the order treating the assc as assc in default for non deduction of tds penalty orders or rectification orders right if the order is passed by the authority income tax authority below the rank of jcit below the rank of the jcit if it's above the rank of jcit then in that case appeal will lie before the cit appeals okay then in case of the cit appeal what are the appealable orders again the assessment order under 143 147 144 is not appealable before cit only 143 and 147 except if the order is passed in pursuance to the directions of the drp or where the gar is invoked the order against the assc where the assc denies his liability under this act which could even include the determination of the buyback tax whether he is assessable to buyback tax or not supreme court in jnpet india then rectification order tpos order order under 163 intimation penalty rectification order all of those orders can be appealed under cit appeal we have form 35 where you have to give the sof and goa plus pay the application fees the time limit is 30 days from the date of notice of demand or the order which is received in case uh, of the in case of the notice of demand is there then in that case the date of notice of 30 days from that you have to make the appeal application in other cases it is date for of the service of the order in within that period 30 days windows from that you have to make the appeal before the cit appeal right along with the application fees then in the, in the case of the cit appeal the cit appeal will decide or will try to decide the appeal within one year window what powers does the cit appeal have he can condone the delay if the appeal is filed after 30 days time limit he can condone it he can decide to put the stay on the demand so stay application has to be filed to cita he can we confirm the addition reduce enhance or annul the assessment he can confirm enhance reduce or cancel the penalty plus levy the penalty he can decide on any matter arising out of assessment even if not raised by the appellant 
So any additional claim can also be raised before the CIT, but it cannot be raised before the assessing officer. Supreme Court in Goyd's case had held that that the additional claim, new claim, fresh claim cannot be raised before the assessing officer, but can be raised before the CIT appeal. Right? In Prithvi Brokers, Bombay High Court has held that. CIT appeal can also admit additional evidence if the AO has refused to admit, AO has prevented the SSC from producing the evidence or has passed the order without considering the evidence. Final. So then, in that case, the appeal shall be decided by the CIT appeal. Then, the order of the CIT appeal can be appealed before the ITAT. Before the ITAT. Even the AO's order, which are basically in relation to the assessment order, which are passed in pursuance to DRP directions, or the assessment order where GAR is invoked, or BCIT or CIT cancelling or refusing the registration of the trust under 12A, 12A, B, ATG, revision order under 263, that all can be appealed before the ITAT. ITAT has benches, the judicial member, accountant member, there can be single bench, there can be special bench in case the benches differ on opinion. The appeal has to be filed in form 36. The time limit is 60 days from the date of the order. The ITAT has the power to condone the delay. Even you can file after 60 days if there's sufficient cause, the ITAT can condone the delay. ITAT will send the notice to the other party, will file the memorandum of cross objections within 30 days of notice. And Again, ITAT has power to entertain the stay of demand. Now, the stay of demand can be given for 180 days. It can be extended for another maximum 365 days. Maximum 365 days, the stay can be extended. And if after 365 days, the hearing is still not decided, and if the delay is not attributable to the SSE, the stay will not get vacated. The stay will not vacate after the 365 days if the delay is not attributable to assessi Supreme Court in PepsiCo, in Pepsi Food case. The condition is for the stay, the condition is that the 20% of the tax should be deposited. The 20% of the tax should be deposited. And then ITAT has to pass the order within four years from the financial year in which the appeal is filed. ITAT is a final fact finding authority. The decision on the fact is final. Of course, you can appeal to High Court for the question of law. If there is any mistake apparent from record, the ITAT can rectify the order within the six months' time of the passing of the order. However, it cannot re decide the matter by adopting a new view. So, Section 254 is not a carte blanche. That means ITAT cannot re -hear the entire matter. The freedom is not given to ITAT to re -hear the entire matter, to pass the uh, opinion in different manner. It cannot recall the order. It can only recall the order if there is mistake apparent from record. Are we clear? Any questions, students? Yes. Good evening, Mansha. Good evening, Simranjit. Good evening, Viraj. Simranji, tax audit will not be covered by me. That will be covered at the very end by uh, the other faculty. So tax audit will not be covered by me at this moment. That will be covered at the very, very end. And somewhere in February, we will be taking up the tax audit chapter as well. So do not worry about that. Good evening, Mohammed. Okay, any doubt, students, any questions with respect to whatever we have done till now? Yes, students. Okay, so let's proceed further. Now, the matter from ITAT goes to the High Court. The matter from the ITAT goes to the High Court. Now, as I said, the ITAT is a final fact-finding authority. So, therefore, any question of fact cannot be uh, or will not traverse to the High Court. So, that cannot be made for an appeal before the High Court. So, only if it is a question of law, only the High Court can decide the question of law. So, here you can just write down. So, after this you have appeal to the High Court. This is under section 268. This is provided under 268. So, 
260A provides that an appeal shall lie to the High Court from every order passed by the ITAT if the High Court is satisfied. If the High Court is satisfied that the case involves substantial question of law. That the case involves substantial question of law. Are you getting that? Yes, Namrata, I will answer that. Uh, Simranji, tax audit, as I said, the tax audit chapter will be taken up in February uh, after the end of all the lectures that we will have. Do not worry about that. That will be taken care for sure. Okay. Yes, Namrata, I will answer about what does the question of law means. So, see, there are two questions in every decision that you get or in every appeal that you make. One could be the question of fact, second is the question of law. What is the question of fact? Let's say, for example, if I talk about the deduction under 35 AD. Let's say, for example, the question relates to that whether my business is an eligible business under 35 AD. That is a very fact-specific question which will differ from the facts of each and every case. Isn't it? It's a fact-specific question. Every case will be very different, right? So, this is a question of fact. It is relating to the facts of each and every assessee. Second is the question of law. Now, question of law meaning that let's say for example, the question relates to that whether I can avail the 35 AD deduction in case Let's say, for example, I have violated one of the conditions which are given under Section 35 AD. Even if I violated the condition under 35 AD. Or let's say, for example, if the question relates to that the interpretation of Section 35 AD or interpretation of any other question, any other section, Let's say it involves the interpretation of Section 37 of the Act. Whether this is an allowable expenditure under 37 or not. Then the matter will go to the High Court. So if the question involves the substantial question of law, only then the matter will travel to the High Court. Now, as I have written over here, that if the High Court is satisfied that the case involves substantial question of law. So, it is not that that you can directly appeal to the High Court. You have to file the application before the High Court, the appeal before the High Court, formulating the questions of law. And then the High Court has to satisfy itself. The High Court should agree to you that yes, indeed, there are questions of law here. In case the High Court feels that there is no question of law which is involved in this case, it will say that the matter is dismissed. That the appeal is dismissed. So the High Court has to agree that yes, there is indeed the involvement of substantial question of law. If there is the substantial question of law existing in your appeal, then the High Court shall, if it is satisfied, then the High Court shall Formulate the
question of law. So high court has to necessarily formulate the question of law. It's not that whatever the assessee will give the question of law in the appeal, the high court has to straight away decide for that. And for that, we have one of the decisions also which is present in your module. In that particular case, in that particular case, the question was that the high court, that the high court decided on the case without framing the substantial questions of law. And the Supreme Court in AA State Private Limited held that, that there lies a distinction between the questions proposed by the appellant while making the admission for the appeal to the High Court and the questions framed by the High Court. Because not all the questions may be the question of law. Not all the questions the High Court would agree that this involves the question of law. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. So, the Supreme Court held that, that the appeal has to be heard on only the question of laws which are framed by the High Court. If the High Court is of the opinion that the appeal which is presented by the appellant does not involve any question of law, it can just say that, it can present the finding that, that the questions proposed by the appellant either do not involve any question of law or are not substantial question of law as to entertain this appeal and it can just dismiss the appeal. It can just dismiss the appeal. Students be very careful with the kind of language I am using. Just be very, very careful. Dismissal of appeal, meaning not deciding, just dismissing appeal. And it is said that if before the questions are decided, the High Court just dismisses the appeal. It is called the Dismissal in limine, L-I-M-I-N-E. Dismiss in limine. What does that mean? That even before the trial began, the appeal stands dismissed. So High Court cannot straight away decide on the appeal which is presented by the appellant. You do not write the word assessi after the appeal procedures begin. It's always appellant. So the High Court has to formulate the questions of law. So you can just write it over here. Supreme Court in a, a state has held that High Court cannot adjudicate directly on questions proposed by the appellant. The High Court needs to, the High Court needs to decide the appeal on question of law formulated by the <clears throat> Are we clear? So basically, the High Court has to formulate the questions of the law. 
मन शायद एवरी केस देर विल बी जजमेंट वेदर इट्स अ क्वेश्चन ऑफ फैक्ट और क्वेश्चन ऑफ लॉ क्वेश्चन ऑफ लॉ मीन्स इट रिलेट्स टू द इंटरप्रिटेशन ऑफ अ सेक्शन क्वेश्चन ऑफ फैक्ट मीन्स इट रिलेट्स टू द इंटरप्रिटेशन ऑफ द फैक्ट ऑफ दैट पर्टिकुलर केस एज ए टोल यू दिलीव there are certain fact specific questions that like whether my business is eligible for the particular deduction or not so that is a question of fact that is a question of fact and in case in case it is pertaining to the interpretation of a provision let's say for example If you look at these particular cases also, now let's look at this A A estate case. This is not a question of fact. That's why this matter has gone even to the Supreme Court. Or let's say, for example, that we were talking about that day the decision where the question was relating to whether the stay will stand vacated after the three sixty five days. If the delay is not attributable to the assessee, that's a question of law because it is involving the interpretation of section two fifty four. Or the question, for example, that whether the ITAT can recall the order again, that is an interpretation of section two fifty four. So these are the question of law and not the question of. fact students are we clear if i filed an appeal and i think there's question of law but actually it is not then who will decide that namrata the high court has to decide that whether there is in fact the question of law existing or true are we clear yes or no students any questions other than this okay so basically only the question of law will go to the high court only the question of law will go to the high court for example recently the court was examining the question on the interpretation of section 224 income definition wherein the one of the clauses where the subsidies or grants are given which is also considered as income that is a question of law that is a question of law so the high court has to formulate those question of law when the appeal is presented of course the appellant will also formulate the question of law but then the high court has to decide and formulate its own question before deciding the appeal are we clear yes or no students any questions yes students uh simran ji we will take care of that aspect as well uh, only if the time permits yes mancha very good the question of law reminds you of the freebies issue yes so it is a question of law if it in fact it is not on the public interest uh, mancha it was not a question of fact it was relating to the law only it was with regard to the interpretation of section 37 it was not a question of fact freebies given by the pharmaceutical companies was not a question of fact it was pertaining to the interpretation of section 37 whether it can be said to be in the violation of the law that was the question so therefore that was not the question of fact mancha are we clear okay so basically you have to be very considerate that what is the question of fact and what is the question of law are we clear yes or no students any question any doubt okay fine so basically if you now look at the high court what are the time limits for filing the appeal before the high court? so the time limit for filing the appeal before the high court 
is 120 days. Is 120 days. So within 120 days, the appeal has to be filed to the High Court. So just write down time limit is 120 days from the date of the seat of the order against which the appeal is to be filed. And the High Court has the power to condone the delay. High Court can condone the delay on sufficient cause which is shown. Okay? Now, matters on which the appeal can be heard. The appeal can be heard, as I said, only on the questions which are formulated. However, even if the question is not formulated, even on those questions, the High Court can allow to hear the question, hear the appeal on any other questions not formulated by it. If it is satisfied that the case is relating to also those questions. So High Court has the power to allow the hearing on any other questions which are not formulated by it if the case involves the deciding of those questions also. Are we clear? And High Court has also the power to determine the issues which have not only been wrongly determined by the ITAT, but also the issues which are not determined by ITAT. So basically, you can write the power of High Court, the appeal shall be decided on question of law. formulated by High Court. However, High Court can allow the appeal on questions not formulated on the question not formulated if it is satisfied that the case involves the question, that the case involves the question, High Court can determine an issue Wrongly decided by the ITAT as well as not decided by the ITAT. And after hearing the appeal, the High Court shall decide the question of law and Provide the grounds on which the decision is found. Now the entire proceedings of the High Court, the appeal before the High Court are governed by the Code of Civil Procedure. Code of Civil Procedure is a separate code which relates to the civil procedure or civil law. And that the income tax law does not govern the appeal before the High Court. It is governed by the Code of Civil Procedure. Now, in the High Court also, there are different benches. There are division bench. So, basically, there are two judges in the division bench. There is a full bench which is there in case the 
there are difference of opinions before, uh, between the different benches, di di between the different division benches, then the case is decided by a full bench, which has more than two members, basically. Three to five members they have. But usually it's a division bench case. Okay, so it's, it's similar to the ITAT where you have a bench, normal bench, and then sometimes if the benches are disagreeing on a particular case, then there is the special bench here. It's a full bench. Okay. Any questions so far, students? Any doubt? Any questions? Yes. Uh, yes, Dilip. If a question relates to the interpretation of a provision, it's a question of law. Namrata, is this fine? I've already uh, been doing on the Zoom only because uh, otherwise if I zoom it much, then there would be a little writing space which will be available. That's why I'm just keeping it to this particular level of Zoom. Okay. Any other questions, students? Any doubt? Any questions? Is the appeal before the High Court clear? Now, one more important point which I would want to highlight to you in case of the appeal before the High Court. Now, in case of the, there was one question which was raised in context of the, whether it's a question of law or it's a question of fact. So how do we decide that particular thing? That was one of the questions which was raised to the Supreme Court. So let me tell you how this happens. This is in the context of SAP laboratories case. This is in the context of the SAP laboratory case. And this is a Supreme Court judgment. Now what was the issue? The issue was in context of the transfer pricing case. Now in transfer pricing students, the under the transfer pricing, you would learn that in the next class after Monday, you will have right the classes on the transfer pricing itself. So from Monday, uh, from Wednesday onwards, you will learn about transfer pricing. Now, in transfer pricing, there is something called as determination of the arm's length price. Determination of the arm's length price, the ALP. Now, determination of ALP students involves a lot of fact-specific exercises. So, what happens? Let me give you a brief idea about how the determination of transfer pricing ALP works. Number the question of fact is the is decided by ITAT and as I told you, ITAT is the final fact finding authority. So if it's a question of fact, then whatever matter is decided by the ITAT that shall be final and no appeal will lie against the decision of ITAT on the question of fact. Simranjit, yes, I will be taking up the international tax classes as well, but not transfer pricing. For transfer pricing, you will have another faculty from Wednesday. International tax, we will resume. I think uh, maybe next to next week, we have classes on international tax. Okay. So basically, students, please be attentive over here now. Try and understand. Let me just explain in brief. So see what happens in the transfer pricing students. Uh, let's say, for example, if I am providing any kinds of goods or services to my associated enterprise, in transfer pricing, we don't use the word related party or related enterprise. We use the term associated enterprise. So if I'm providing or availing any goods, services from my or to my associated enterprise, the pricing of those goods or services has to be at the arm's length price. It cannot be at any arbitrary price. It has to be at the arm's length price. Now what is arm's length price? Arm's length price is the price of those goods or services which the similar independent 
enterprise a comparable independent enterprise would have paid in the similar circumstances so a comparable independent enterprise would have paid in the similar circumstances let's say for example if i am selling the um maybe let's say for example in the related associated enterprise transaction relates to the let's say purchase of footwear let's say purchase of footwear or let's say for example purchase of the car now if let's say for example ford india is purchasing car from ford germany the price of that purchase has to be the price which an independent and car dealer would be ready to pay who is not related to ford germany let's say for example if maruti would have imported this similar car from abroad how much it would have paid that is the arms length price so <coughs> so for computing the arms length price student we take the help of databases we take the help of the database there are very database which are available proves capitaline these are the name of database which have certain database of the public companies so what we do is we put lot of filters in those database to arrive at the comparable company <coughs> to arrive at the comparable company right that let's say for example who would be comparable to ford so to arrive at that i will have to put in lot of filters so i will put let's say a manufacturer who is in the car business who sales should also be comparable to me let's say sales more than 10 cr it should not be a small trader or small manufacturer whose gross profit ratio should be this which should not be a government entity because they are not into profit business so there are many filters that i will apply and i will come to the comparable company so that to achieve the best possible comparable price as i could get now the problem here is whether a company is a comparable company to me or not whether a company is which is selected for the purpose of calculating the arms length price is comparable to my company or not how have we arrived at the calculation of arms length price till now it was understood by everybody that this is a question of fact which is rightly so also what is comparable to me what is not comparable to me it's a question of fact it's a business specific you know fact specific exercise that we carry out but the supreme court its sap laboratories supreme court in the sap lab case has held that that this is not a question of fact that this is not a question of fact anymore this is a substantial question of law so the supreme court as i said in sap lab case has held that that the high court has the power to consider the determination of alp and that's a sub substantial question of law so determination of the arms length price is substantial question of law now on what grounds did this supreme court arrive at this particular conclusion it said while determining the alp it is not only that we have to look as to which are which companies are comparable to me or not 
it is necessary to look at whether the ITAT has applied the principles under Chapter 10, which is relating to the transfer pricing from Section 92 to 92F properly or not. So any determination of ALP, if it is not in accordance with the provisions of Chapter 10 or the relevant rules, can be considered as perverse and it may be considered as a question of law because the provisions are not applied correctly. So the Supreme Court said there cannot be a blanket answer that determination of ALP is always a fact-specific exercise and the High Court is excluded from deciding on that. No. There cannot be any absolute proposition of law like that. So one cannot say that in all the cases, wherever the ALP is determined by the tribunal, that is final and the same cannot travel to the High Court. It is up to the High Court to decide and to examine whether the ALP has been determined taking into account the relevant provisions of the Act or not. And then the High Court has to decide if it involves a substantial question of law. The High Court has the power to examine the question of comparability of two companies or selection of different filters and whether the same is done properly or not. The High Court has the power. It is not a question of fact. So, in case of determination of ALP by the tribunal, that is not always going to be considered as final. And it is always open to High Court to examine the case whether while determining the ALP, the provisions of the Act are considered by the tribunal properly or not. So this is the Supreme Court decision. You can just write it over here. There cannot be absolute proposition that that the determination of ALP by the ITAT is final. It is always open to High Court to determine whether the ITAT has Determine the ALP, including the question of comparability of two companies, comparability of two companies as per the provisions of Chapter 10 and there. Are we clear? So what is substantial question of law is nowhere defined. That is up to the High Court to examine that whether there is a substantial question of law which is existing or not. So till now, it used to be the case that always, you know, in case of there was question on comparability of two companies or determination of ALPs, High Court used to reject these matters, saying that, that the tribunal has already decided, tribunal is a final fact-finding authority. And therefore, these are fact questions, question of fact, and therefore the High Court will not intervene in these matters. So once the tribunal has decided it, the same cannot be subject to the appeal or scrutiny by the High Court. 
because these are the question of fact. However, in this case, in this particular case, the apex court has held that the determination of ALP, choice of comparable companies, can be construed as substantial question of law. Because if the ALP is determined contrary to the provisions of Chapter 10, then it warrants the intervention of the High Court. So you can write, if the ALP is determined, Contrary to provisions of chapter 10, it involves, it requires intervention of high court. Yes. Yes or no students, any question? Yes, students, any doubt, any questions? Yes, is this clear? Okay. Now, similarly, in respect of the appeal before the High Court, there are few other issues that we have to take into consideration. Can the High Court review its order? Can the High Court review its order? Now, if you remember, I told you for the ITA. <coughs> if you remember, I told you for the ITA <coughs> that the ITA has the power to rectify the mistake which is apparent from record students. To rectify the mistake which is apparent from records. Isn't it? We discussed that, right? However, the ITAT does not have a power to review or reappreciate the correctness of its earlier decision. So, it is not open to the ITAT to reconsider the entire matter and come up with a different conclusion. That is not possible. In case there is mistake apparent from record, it can even recall its order. But there should be a mistake apparent from record. And if this mistake apparent from record is going to result to the parties, the grave injustice or is going to cause the prejudice to the parties, then it can recall its order also. But it cannot just recall the entire order and rear the entire matter. Because that would amount to the taking the different conclusion. So similarly, in the case of the High Court, the High Court can also review its order where there is a mistake apparent on the face of the record. Or there is some discovery of an important matter or a new matter which was not produced by the petitioner prior. However, the review of the order is not permissible to just change the conclusion of the High Court. So if it is just involving change of opinion, a review is not maintainable. Just because there are two views which are possible, that will not result in the review of the order. So therefore, <clears throat> the High Court has power to review its order to prevent the miscarriage of justice or to correct some grave errors which are there. But it cannot 
just re-hear the entire matter or come to a different conclusion. It's a similar thing even in the case of the ITAT. Chapter 10, Delhi is transfer pricing provision. Delhi, there is a difference between recall and review. Recall meaning I'm just taking back my order as if it's not passed. Review means I'm going through the order again. I'm reviewing. Are we clear? So review is I'm going through the matter in a different from a different perspective once again. That is not permissible. Even recall is not permissible if it is to give a different conclusion. If it is to rectify a mistake apparent from recall, you can recall the order. Yes or no students, you just write down. High court, or you can just write powers of high court. High court can rectify the mistake apparent from the court. High court can rectify the mistake which is apparent from record. <clears throat> the high court can review its order. The high court can review its order where There is discovery of where is there, there is discovery of new and important matter which was not in the knowledge. of the petitioner there is a mistake apparent from record the review is not possible or you can just write third point to prevent the miscarriage of justice Prevent the miscarriage of justice or to correct the errors. The review. The review of order. The review of order will not be maintainable. Review of order will not be maintainable where there is reputation of <coughs> earlier arguments, <coughs> possibility of two views. Possibility of two views. Okay. 
So basically, in those cases, the review is not maintainable. So you can write down Supreme Court in Meghalaya Steels. Supreme Court in Meghalaya Steels Limited. And this was also held in Sunil Vasudeva. Okay. Yes. Any questions, students? So after High Court, the matter will now travel to the Supreme Court. After the High Court, the matter will now move to the Supreme Court. Now in the Supreme Court, again, the question which can go to the Supreme Court is, uh, is basically the going to be the order of the High Court here. There is no difference between, uh, or there is no difference required per se because whatever is the order of the high court you can file an appeal to the supreme court under section 261 so directly there will be appeal to the supreme court the section 261 so any appeal against the judgment of the high court will lie now before the supreme court again this will be governed by the code of the civil procedure this will be governed by the code of the civil procedure. Now be very careful here at, before the high court, before the supreme court, the chartered accountants cannot argue. The chartered accountants will not be able to argue, right? So this can be only done by the lawyers, by the advocates, not by the lawyers also, by the advocates who are registered with the bar council. Are we clear? So we cannot, we can only argue up to the ITAT level. We can only argue up to the ITAT level. Now, before the Supreme Court, there may not only be the appeal which can be filed, of course, against the order of the High Court, you can file the appeal to the Supreme Court, but there can also be a special leave petition. There can also be a special leave petition which can be filed. The SLP, which is called as the SLP. Now, SLP which is there is basically an appeal to the Supreme Court if you are unsatisfied by the judgment by the High Court, which is under the Constitution of India. So this is an appeal which is made to the Supreme Court directly against the order of the High Court, which is called as a special leave petition. So it is not direct as an appeal, but it can also be appealed against the order of any subordinate court also. A special leave petition, SLP, can be filed against any order which is under 136 of constitution. This is not under 261 of the income tax act. Right? Under 261 of the income tax act, right? you can file an appeal. But special leave petition is filed under 136 of the constitution. And it is up to the Supreme Court whether it will admit the same or not. Are we clear? So this is filed under the Indian Constitution, the SLP is filed under the Constitution. Okay, students, so is it clear? Any question, any doubt? Yes, students, is the appeal mechanism clear? Yes. So special leave petition, yes, is an extraordinary power which is given to the Supreme Court and where a question of general public importance has been raised, in those cases, the special leave petition can be filed. So it can be against the pending orders which are not yet passed by the High Court, which are passed by the tribunals, which are pending before the High Court. In those cases also, special leave petition can be requested. Yes? Yes, students? Okay, so now there are, yes, there are a few questions. Special leave petition, as I said, Mansha, uh, Namrata, is basically 
the special power which is given under 136 of the constitution. So article 136 of the Indian constitution gives the power to the Supreme Court with regard to the SLP. So special leave petition, this is the power, the constitution of India under 136 vests the Supreme Court with a special power to grant the special leave, to grant this permit to appeal against any judgment or order or any decree in any matter which is passed or made by any court or tribunal. It can be against any court or any tribunal. It is, it is not necessarily only going to be against the high court order. So if, if you are you know, wanting to do any appeal against the high court order, you can file the appeal to the Supreme Court under 261. But in case the order has not yet been passed by the High Court and if the matter is going to be of the general importance, then one can file the SLP. So SLP can be filed even if there is no matter, uh, even if the matter is not decided by the High Court. Even if the matter is yet pending before the High Court. It is only passed by the tribunal. So one can directly go for the SLP. Are we clear? Yes, students, any question? Any doubt? So it's a discretionary power given to the Supreme Court. This is a discretionary power. It is not that in every case the SLP will be accepted. So this is only where there is some legal issue which is existing or any constitutional issue which is existing. This matter can be decided by the uh, through the SLP. Yes, any other question? Yes, Namrata, I will summarize. Dilip, when the appeal is filed in High Court, whether the case is treated as a fresh like stages of trial are conducted like planned summons, written statement. No, 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 no. Uh, Dilip, those are under the criminal procedure. The trial, summons, all of that, written statements, those are under the criminal procedure code. Here it is not treated as a fresh, it is taken over from the where the tribunal has left. Clear Dilip? <clears throat> so immediately after the appeal is uh, decided by the tribunal, we will go to High Court by formulating the questions of law, by proposing that these are the questions of law, we will file the appeal in a similar manner and then the High Court will decide that whether it's a fit case, whether there are indeed the substantial question of law and based on that it will formulate and then decide on the appeal. So you know in case you are interested ever students, you can always go out and watch the decisions of the High Court and Supreme Court, how the matters are being taken up. Now you know you are very lucky enough because these kind of cases are now available online. The Bombay High Court, the Gujarat High Court is Taking up the hearings online, it's available to the entire public. So therefore, you can go and see how the hearings are taking place. You can just watch the income tax cases. You can watch the company law cases. You'll be amazed to see how the decisions are being argued. And by that, in fact, you will learn more. Just go on YouTube and if, once just search for these cases. You can find easily the income tax cases which are argued before the High Court. See Gujarat High Court, see Bombay High Court. Same is the case with the Supreme Court students. You can just go and listen to it. You can do it tonight, in fact. Yes, any other questions, students? Yes or no? Okay, is this clear? Any doubt, any questions? Okay. So now, basically, see, there are certain monetary limits which are set students. Now what are these monetary limits which are set? We are going to talk about that. So basically, you know what was happening till now is that the revenue is always the first one to appeal. If you will see, if you will ever take a note of the appeals which are filed before the High Court or Supreme Court, most often the appeals are filed by the revenue rather than the assessment. Most of the appeals are filed by the revenue. 
So therefore, in order to reduce the litigation, because there's a huge backlog, there are very limited benches and High Court does not have a special bench, you know, only for the tax matters. There are multiple other cases which are happening at high court level. Same is the case with Supreme Court. Now, Supreme Court has also benches for tax. But, you know, there are many other matters. There are very few judges which are there. So, therefore, it results in a lot of pending cases. So, therefore, to curb the cases by the revenue side, So for that, the thresholds are introduced, the monetary limits are introduced. Now, what are these monetary limits? So, the CBDT has given the instructions, has basically issued the instruction, has specified the monetary limit for the Departmental appeals, these monetary limits are not applicable to the assessee filing the appeals. These are applicable for filing the departmental appeals. Before the ITAT, High Court, Supreme Court, SLPs, including the SLPs. So, CBDT has decided that appeals or SLPs shall not be filed in cases where the tax effect does not exceed these monetary limits. So what are those? You can just write it over here. SLP under 136 of Constitution. This is to decide matters of general importance. Okay? <clears throat> this is to decide the matters of general importance. You can just write that. Now, as I said, the CBDT has issued these or prescribed these monetary limits. Yes, I can give you the example of SLP. So, SLPs are basically filed against the High Court judgment only. It is not that it's not filed against the High Court judgment, but it can even be filed even when the High Court judgment is uh, not yet passed. High Court has not yet given its judgment. So, SLP can even be filed against those cases. Are we clear? Okay. So now, with respect to the monetary limits which are there. Now, the monetary limits which are existing. So, CBDT, you can just write. As described the monetary limits. For departmental for the departmental appeal. And what are these monetary limits, students? So just write down the appeal or SLP. shall not be fine appeal or SLP shall not be filed in cases where the tax effect does not exceed the following monetary limits. For ITAT, it is rupees 50 lakh. 
for the high court it is rupees 1 crore and for the supreme court it is rupees 2 crores now you will at this you will ask me ma'am what is this tax effect <clears throat> what is this tax effect if the tax effect does not exceed what is the tax effect so tax effect is basically the tax on the disputed income so this is tax on disputed income this is the tax on the disputed income or if the appeal is in relation to the penalty then the penalty which is there or the penalty okay so this is the tax on the disputed income so the appeal will not be filed by the department understand this is departmental appeal if the tax effect does not exceed these limits if the tax on the disputed income is not exceeding these amounts now does that mean that the department has accepted the defeat so let's say for example if it's a question now before the high court if it's an itat order and let's say the tax effect is less than rupees 1 cr so obviously even if it's a question of law department cannot appeal to the high court so does that mean let's say for example in the previous year 2122 let's say the itat passed the order against the revenue and let's say my tax effect was less than rupees 1 so appeal to high court is not possible even if it involves the substantial question of law but let's say in the next year in previous year 2223 again the itat passed the order against the revenue let's say relying on the previous year order itself it's a relied order of the previous year so basically relying on the previous year itat passed the adverse order even in this year but let's say this year the tax effect was piece 1.5 cr so can the assc argue that the department has accepted the itat order in the pa past year by not filing the appeal before the high court so in this year also department cannot go for appeal the answer is no so cbdt has clarified just because because of the monetary limit the department is not allowed to appeal in this particular year it does not mean that department has accepted the itat's judgment that kind of inference should not be drawn so just because the tax effect is less it does not mean that the department will be precluded from filing the appeal for subsequent years so for this year department is not precluded from filing appeal before the high court are we clear so that kind of inference cannot be drawn are we clear yes or no so assc cannot say for this year assc cannot contend that department has 
accepted the decision of yes now where the monetary limits will not be applicable so monetary limits will not be applicable in cases are not applicable where if it is challenge to the constitutional provision challenge to the constitutionality of provision that whether this provision is valid from the constitutional perspective whether it's constitutionally valid whether it is challenging the fundamental freedoms or whether it is kind of uh, constitutionally invalid provision so those kind of questions there the monetary limit will not be applicable where the circular or notification by the cbdt is illegal or ultra virus so a question relates to that where question relates to these provisions where the addition relates to undisclosed foreign income foreign income or foreign assets where the addition is based on where the addition is based on information received from enforcement agencies for example cbi SFIO, GST, prosecution filed by department, or where the revenue object objection in the case of revenue audit objection accepted by the department and finally writ petitions writ petitions are again different there are different writ petitions which challenge the constitutional provision so for that the writ petitions are filed or where the appeal is not available against any particular provision so in those cases you can file the writ petition for example if i told you that against the order passed under 264 the revision order there is no appeal which lies so what you can do you can file the writ petition so wherever the appeal option is not available you can uh, file the writ petition under the indian constitution okay so there are different kinds of writ under the indian constitution you can file the writ petition so the petition to these the monetary limits are not up Number the tax effect, as I said, the tax on the disputed income. So whatever income which is under the dispute on that, the tax implication which is there, the tax liability which is there, is the tax effect. So tax on the disputed income, number the SLP can only be filed to the Supreme Court. It's a special power given to the Supreme Court, number the. Mansha, as I said, for the appeal, the appeal lies against the decision of the high court slp can be against the decision of high court can even be against the matters which are pending before the high court which are not yet decided by the high court okay so in those cases it's the slp special leave petition writ petition namrata as i said it's a constitutional provision where the 
writs can be filed to the high court or to the supreme court so these are the special powers which are given under the indian constitution a writ petition is kind of an application given to the high court or the supreme court seeking the judicial intervention when there is violation of the fundamental rights in those cases the writ petitions are filed okay students so let's take a small break of 10 minutes over here and then we get back let's take a break of 10 minutes
स्टूडेंट्स नाउ इन केस ऑफ द अपील लास्ट वन इम्पॉर्टेंट पॉइंट और द इम्पॉर्टेंट प्रोविजन दैट आई वॉन्टेड टू डिस्कस एंड विद दैट द अपील्स टॉपिक वुड एंटायरली क्लोज एक्सेप्ट येस वी हैव टू डू द रिविजन दैट वी विल डू रिविजन अंडर टू सिक्सटी थ्री दैट इज ऑट वी हैव टू डू एंड देन द अपील विल बी ओवर देन वील मूव टू द डिस्प्यूट रिजल्यूशन कमिटी ओके सो नाउ अंडरस्टैंड द स्टूडेंट्स so in respect of the appeals before the high court and the supreme court okay there is a provision which is there which says that in case of the appeals which are filed by the assc before the high court or before the supreme court now it's quite possible students that let's say for example for the previous year 2122 the appeal is pending before the high court this appeal is by the assc and there is a identical issue for previous year 2223 there is this identical issue which has arise in the assessment now again what will happen the assc will appeal to the cit appeal to the high court and then uh, to the itat and then to the high court so there is section 158a there is section 158a when there is identical issue pending before the high court or the supreme court <clears throat> so when an identical question of law is pending before the high court or supreme court and a similar question is arising which is now in the assessment order or in the during the assessment not in assessment order during the assessment which is now pending before the ao or before the cit or before the itat so identical issue in assessment or in appeal then in this case the assc can furnish the declaration to the ao or to the cit appeals or itat that whatever will be the outcome of the decision of high court or supreme court you can apply the same even if it is against me you can apply the same and then i will not raise this question again before the any other court or before any appellate tribunal i will not appeal against that decision so in this particular case this is to avoid the repetitive appeals being filed for each year so as a c can furnish the declaration that <clears throat> declaration to the ao or to the cit appeals or itat as the case may be as the case may be to agree to apply to agree to apply the decision of the high court or supreme court in present case and not to appeal against the said decision and not and the cc shall not file and assc shall not appeal the said question of law the said issue or assc shall not appeal against the said issue
So uh, assessee can just say whatever will be the decision which will be given by the high court, we, the AO or the CITAB or ITAT can apply the same. Meanwhile, what the assessing officer can do? The assessing officer can examine the claim of the assessee that yes, indeed, whether the issue is same in that particular year or not. So, assessing officer will first examine the correctness of the claim of the assessee, that whether the issue of previous year 21 22 is similar to 22 23. And then can admit the claim of the assessee in case it is satisfied that yes, the question of law is same in both the years. And then the assessing officer can just pass the order without waiting for the decision of the High Court or Supreme Court. And when the final decision is passed by the High Court or Supreme Court, the assessing officer or the CITA or ITAT will apply that decision to the present case and amend the order. Now this order will be final and cannot be appealed further. This is to avoid the repetitive appeals. So, assessee can furnish the declaration. AO can verify the claim of the assessee as to whether the issue is same in both the years and may admit or reject the claim of assessee. Then AO or the CIT appeal or the ITAT shall pass the order without waiting for decision of High Court or Supreme. And then based on the decision of High Court or Supreme Court, amend the order passed. Amend the order passed <coughs> to conform to such decision. This order shall be final and non appealable. Yes, students, are we clear? Yes or no? So this is to avoid the repetitive appeals being filed. Uh, the leave this rest judicator and rest subsidies are basically uh, it's the same thing that rest judicator bars the parties from filing the suit. So yes, of course, it's the same principle. But here it's not the case of rest subjudice because it bars the trial between the parties. So it's a kind of principle of the rest judicator. You are very correct. Absolutely very nice. So the rest judicator means the rest judicator means a subject matter which is already being judged. That once a decision is accepted, it, uh, once a decision has been passed, it must be accepted as final. And you cannot appeal against that particular decision. So this is to avoid the repetitive appeals. Okay. Now similar principle also exists for the departmental appeal. This is the appeal by the SSE. There is a similar principle which exists for the departmental appeals, which is under 158 AB. This is 
identical issue pending before the Supreme Court or High Court in Assisi appeal. And 158AB which is there. This is where the appeal is by the revenue. Where identical issue is pending before the High Court or Supreme Court. Before the High Court or Supreme Court. So 158AB provides that where the collegium is of the opinion. <clears throat> where collegium. What is the meaning of collegium? Collegium is two or more CCITs or PCITs. Or the CITs. Where the collegium is of the opinion. Is of the opinion that. Any question of law. Obviously, it's going to be a question of law because it's pending before High Court or Supreme Court. Is identical. Is identical with. Question of law. Already raised. For any other assessment here or for any other assessing for any assessment here. So not only the issue is same for any other assessment here. But if the issue is same for even any other assessee, let's say for example, here the assessment is happening for the company A for previous year 21-22. And let's say this is on section 37 that the issue is persisting. And let's say for company B for AY, Fifteen sixteen on the same issue in section thirty seven matter is pending before the high court. The matter is pending before the high court. So if any question of law is identical with question of law already raised either before the high court. Or the Supreme Court against the order of the High Court or the ITA. Then the collegium may decide and inform the AO to not file any appeal at this stage to the ITA or to the High Court. So basically, in this particular case. Collegium shall inform the PCIT or CIT to not file the appeal, to not file the appeal against, against the decision of against the 
ऑर्डर ऑफ सी और जे अपील सो सी अपील और जे अपील और दी आई टी ए टी और दी आई टी ए टी सो बेसिकली दी कोलेजियम विल डिसाइड दैट सो टू और मोर पीसीआई और सीसीआई और PCIT or CIT will together, which is this collegium will be formed by CBDT, will decide that whether this question is identical or not. And then what this PCIT or CIT will do <laughs> on receiving this communication from the collegium, the PCIT or CIT will first communicate this to the assessee. and the assessee has to in this case accept that that the question of law is identical see when the assessee was saying that the question of law is identical with his own another uh, with his uh, with, in his own case for some another year then the ao had to verify that claim that yes indeed the question of law, law is identical otherwise without verification they can say any case is pending and then you know the time will go waste similarly here if the revenue is saying that the question of law is identical either in this assessee's case or in some other assessee's case the assessee has to agree with that so inform the assessee and obtain his acceptance okay and then application to be filed then the application will be made to the ITAT or to the high court the application will be made to the ITAT or high court stating that that the appeal on this question of law may be filed when the decision of the high court or supreme court will become final so they will inform at the moment because see you have to file against the cita's order you have to file the appeal to the itat and similarly you have to file the appeal against the itat order to the high court now there is a time limit to file the appeal 60 days before the tribunal 120 days before the high court now if you miss that deadline later on the high court or the itat may not condone that delay so therefore you will give the application to the itat or high court that this matter is pending before either the high court or supreme court and we will file the appeal when the decision on the question of law becomes final okay <clears throat> so application to be filed to the itat or to the high court within 120 days this application needs to be filed 120 days from the communication from the order of the sorry not from the communication 120 days from the order of cit appeals or itat that appeal shall be filed on finality of the decision of high court or supreme court again this is to avoid the repetitive appeals now what will happen when the high court or supreme court order is passed so in the case where the high court or supreme court decides in the favor of the department now the cita's order or itat's order is against the department right obviously that is why they were going into appeal now they are saying we'll wait we will not immediately go for appeal are you getting this so here you can 
sorry, here this should not be assessment, here this should be CIT appeal. Now this CIT appeal for the company A which is pending, this CIT's order is let's say against the department. So department was wanting to file the appeal but it will wait until the order of the high court comes. So department here <coughs> shall wait until high court order. So this is the pending before high court. Here this is the department appeal which is pending before the high court. Now let's say for example the decision of this appeal of before the high court is that this high court gives the order in favor of department. Now what will department do? <coughs> so in this case, the PCIT or CIT will direct the AO to file the appeal to the ITAT or high court now. Because if let's say for example the high court would have given the order in the assessee's favor, the department would have just set point. They would have not gone ahead and filed the appeal. Are you getting this? So let's say for example this is a favorable decision which has come to company A. So this is against department. Now department will not file the appeal against this CIT order or ITAT order. It will wait Till the appeal is concluded by the High Court or Supreme Court in Company B's case or in Company A's case for any other year. And it gives the application to the ITAT or High Court that we are not filing the appeal today. We will file the appeal if the de decision comes in our favor at a later point. When the High Court will decide the case. This is to avoid the repetitive appeals. So, on decision of High Court or Supreme Court in favor of department AO shall file appeal within 60 days or 120 days. So within 60 days to ITAT or 120 days to the High Court. This is from the date of order of High Court or Supreme Court. Yes, students, is this clear? Yes, very good question. During such period, whether interest on tax liability continues or gets waved off. So for that, Dri, that's a very, very good question. See whether the interest during that period continues or waved off is required to be seen from the perspective of Section 234 A, B and C. So that needs to be seen from that perspective. So if you look at it, that the interest will be going on. There is no exclusion to that. So the interest which is there is on the tax which is paid. Uh, sorry, tax which is payable. Now the tax which is payable is basically already determined under assessment order. So if you are obtaining the stay, of course the interest will be not computed during that period because you have received the stay petition. But in case you are not getting stay relief, then in that case the interest will continue to be there. So it depends on whether you are getting the stay or not. Because in case you are not getting the stay, you have to make the payment of the taxes with, along with the interest. In case you are not paying, then the interest will continue to mount. So it depends on the stay application whether you have got or not. Clear the leap? Yes, students, any other question? Is this clear? Any doubt? Any question? Is this clear? 
Yes or no, students? Yes, students, master. I want to know whether this is clear. Yes, okay. Now, the last part of the appeals. So, we have done the revision under 264. Students, you remember, I told you about the revision under 264, which is an option which is given to the SSE. One is you file a rectification under 154 if it's a mistake apparent from record. Then you have an option of revision under 264. And the third one is the appeal, which is there to the CIT appeal, JCIT appeal or under 246A or 246, right? Now, the revision of order can also happen from the department side. So, just write down here. <clears throat> revision of order under section 263. Revision of order under 263. Now, under 263, the principal chief commissioner of income tax or the chief commissioner of income tax or the PCIT or the CIT is mainly the uh, mainly the superior authorities. I will call them as superior authorities. If they consider if these superior authorities consider that any order passed by the subordinate authority passed by the A or the transfer pricing officer under section 92CA. Is erroneous, is erroneous in so far as is erroneous, is wrong in so far as it is prejudicial to the interest of revenue. So here, see what is happening is the department is scrutinizing its own order. Are you getting that thing? So in your office also it might be happening, right? You may be doing your work. Your seniors would be examining those work or examining that work, right? To see that whether you have done the task correctly or not. So here also the superior authorities will examine that whether the orders which are passed by the AO or the TPO are correct or not. And if they are of the opinion that it is erroneous, it is wrong, in so far as it is prejudicial to the interest of, of revenue, they can make the revision of the order under 263. Now, an order shall be deemed to be erroneous. Order deemed to be erroneous in so far as it is prejudicial to the interest of revenue. If the if in the opinion of the PCCIT, CCIT or PCIT or CIT, the order is passed, this is a deeming provision, okay? Order is passed, the order is passed without making inquiries 
और वेरिफिकेशन The order is passed without making inquiries or verification. <clears throat> order is passed allowing any relief allowing any relief without inquiring into the claim. third order has not been made the order has not been made in accordance with the order has not been made in accordance with any direction or instruction of cbdt so cbdt gives the directions to the assessing officers or to the um any kind of instructions it gives or any kind of directions that it gives to the assessing officers to do or handle the assessments in a particular manner so these are the internal instructions given by the cbdt under 119 so see under section 119 the cbdt has a power to issue the orders to issue the instructions to issue the directions to the assessing officers for the proper administration of the act right so in that particular case this the ao has not followed the directions or the instructions of the cbdt are we clear so that order will be deemed to be erroneous in so far as it is prejudicial to the interest of the revenue next is order has not been passed the order has not been passed in accordance with in accordance with the high court or supreme court ruling in favor of the department which is in favor of the department so then the revenue shall consider to revise the order but before that it has to grant the uh, assessee an opportunity of being heard and it will make again the inquiries and pass the revision order so grant opportunity of being heard to assess from the opportunity of being heard to assess and after making the inquiries after making the inquiries pass the revision order under section 263 pass the revision order under 263 okay now this order can enhance the assessment this can result in enhancement the assessment or modification of assessment or cancellation of assessment or directing the fresh assessment or directing the fresh assessment then it can result in cancellation of the assessment or modification of assessment or enhancing the assessment and directing the fresh assessment 
Now this order, the time limit is 2 years from the end of the financial year. 2 years from the end of the financial year in which the order is passed. So 2 years from the passing of the order, the 263 order will get passed. Yes or no, is this clear? So this is the order under section 263, revision order under 263 which can be carried out by the revenue with regard to the orders passed by the assessing officer itself. Now, <clears throat> there is an important concept which I am going to raise now. This is illustrative list delete. It's not an exhaustive list. This is just the deeming provision. And in these cases, it will be deemed that the order is erroneous. There could be multiple other cases. See, the question which arises, student, is there is a concept of... So, I think there's some background noise. Yeah, there's a concept of doctrine of partial merger and doctrine of total merger. Now, what is this concept, students? Let's try and understand. Doctrine of partial merger and doctrine of total merger. Let's understand, students. Let's say, for example, I'm talking about my assessment order. This is the assessment order. Let's say for example, there are three issues. One is relating to, let's say, additional depreciation. Second is section 37. And third is, let's say, section 80G claim. There are three issues in my assessment order. Fine. Now, let's say for example, I decide to go for this particular issue to the CIT appeal. The question now arises, can for this particular issue, I file section 154, rectification. And for this particular issue, I go for section 264, revision. Can I do that? So here comes this doctrine of partial merger and doctrine of total merger. So doctrine of total merger means that the order of the lower authority will get merged with the order of the higher authority. That is the doctrine of total merger. What is the doctrine of total merger providing? That the order which is passed by any authority. So that order gets merged with the order you are now appealing to or you are, you are taking any other remedy for. So that is the doctrine of total merger. It's a doctrine which is used in the common law. So basically, these are legal doctrines. These are not any codified principles. These are just legal principles. Which means that there cannot be more than one order governing the same subject matter at a given point of time. So there can be only one order at one point of time. That is the doctrine of merger, basically. <clears throat> so in case where there is the issue which has gone into an appeal. In case the issue where an appeal or revision is pending for an issue. For the same issue, the doctrine of merger will restrict me. So the doctrine of total merger will restrict me. That for this issue, I cannot go for the another remedy which is available. So doctrine of merger says 
that where an appeal or revision is pending already on an issue then the then the order of the assessing officer will merge with the order of the cit appeal and then the order of the cit appeal will be only remaining there cannot be more than one order at a given point of time so i cannot appeal against the cit appeal order can i appeal sorry can i make a revision petition against the cit appeal order answer is no i can appeal so i can revise the assessment order i can make an application for the revision of the assessment order at a given point of time as per the doctrine of merger there can only be one order which is existing so the order of the assessing officer merges with the order of the cit appeal the moment i go for cit appeal so at this stage as per the doctrine of total merger order of ao merges with order of cit appeal now i cannot make a revision application against the cit appeal order right so therefore even if i am going for one issue to cit appeal i cannot even go for 264 revision over here because here the doctrine of total merger operates which says that if one of the issue is appealed before the cita the order of ao merges with cit appeal order therefore against any other issue revision under 264 cannot be made even if appeal is not filed for that issue that is the doctrine of total merger so if i have gone for up i can choose only one remedy at a time if i am going to cit appeal for additional depreciation obviously i cannot go for 154 or 264 for the same issue i can only decide to go with one but for the rest of the issues what can i do for 154 year doctrine of partial merger applies now what is the partial merger partial merger says that only with respect to issue that has gone to appeal only with respect to the issue that has gone to appeal the order of ao merges with cit appeal only with respect to that issue so i can go for 154 application because here the doctrine of partial merger applies so in case of section 154 as well as section 263 if an issue is pending before cit appeal 154 or 263 cannot be filed for issues 
not taken up before the CIT appeal 154 or 263 can be filed. Are you getting this kind of distinction? So in case of 154 and 263, the doctrine of partial merger applies. Whereas in the case of 264, the doctrine of total merger applies. Meaning, even if for that issue I have not gone into appeal, I cannot go for 264 revision. So if I have gone to appeal for any one issue, I cannot go for remaining issues under 264. But in the case of 154 and in the case of 263, only with that limited issue which has gone to appeal, for that 263 or 154 is not possible. For other issues which are not gone into appeal, for those issues 263 and 154 can apply. Yes, students, is it clear? Any questions, any doubt? Yes or no? Yes, Pastor, let me know. Are you clear with this? Yes, students, any questions that you have? Yes, Pastor. Please, students, tell me the answers that if you are done. If SSC finds revision under 264, then the same appeal under CIT cannot be filed, right? Yes. So when you're going for 264 delete, you have to give a declaration that you are revoking the right to go for appeal. So if you go to 264, I think we have written it over here. See, here the application can be made to the PCCIT or CIT under 264 with the promise that, that the appeal shall not be preferred. So, in the case of the revision under 264, here the appeal will not be preferred against the same issue. Are we clear? So, where an appeal against the order lies or the uh, tribunal, again, uh, appeal against the order lies before the CITA or the tribunal. But even if the appeal has not been made and even the time limit for the appeal has not expired or the SSC has not waived his right of appeal. So in those cases also 264 cannot be preferred. So you can just write it over here. Rectif revision under section 264 cannot be made if time limit for filing appeal has not expired or SSC has not waived the right of appeal. SC has not waived the right of appeal or order is subject matter of appeal. In these cases, 264 cannot be filed. Yes or no? Any questions? Any doubt? <clears throat> yes, Ashish, very good. Okay, so now we are done with the appeals topic in entirety. Now there is one more point I told you, which is another option which has now come up, which is Dispute Resolution Committee, DRC. We'll talk about DRP at the very end because this is more relating to the transfer pricing cases. So we are going to talk about DRP later. Or let's first talk about DRP and then we'll go to the DRC. So I'm not going to dwell much into the DRP 
for the reason that you will again learn that as a part of the assessment uh, transfer pricing class also the dispute resolution panel now what happens in the case of the transfer pricing cases see students first i'll talk about the drp so see If you go back to your assessment class, assessment notes which are there, right? Assessment procedure. Here, if you remember, I told you that in case of the GAR also, the assessment operates in a different manner. Didn't I? So, in the case of GAR, we understood that the assessment operates in a different manner where the reference is made to the PCCIT or CIT at any stage of the proceedings where the GAR has to be involved. Similarly, in the case of transfer pricing, the determination of the arm's length price, the AO may not be equipped to do that. So, if you remember, we talked about while dealing with the Faceless assessment center, I told you that if the EU wants, it can seek the technical assistance in respect of determination of FMV or ALP. So in that case, the AU may request to NFAC to, to seek the help from the technical unit, to seek the technical assistance from technical unit. In the technical unit, there will be a transfer pricing officer. So, where a person enters into an international transaction or a specified domestic transaction and the AO considers it necessary, he may, with the previous approval of PCIT or CIT, refer the computation of ALP to the transfer pricing officer. So just write down. Assessment in case of transfer pricing. So AO with the approval of PCIT or the CIT from the higher authorities basically if he considers necessary in case of assessee entering into international transaction or the specified domestic transaction refer the case to transfer pricing officer with the previous approval of the PCIT or CIT refer the computation of ALP you can write refer the computation of ALP to the transfer pricing officer. Are we clear? This is under section 92 CA. Now where a reference is made to the transfer pricing officer, the transfer pricing officer will then serve a notice on the assessee requiring the evidence in support of how he has made the computation of ALP. So then TPO shall issue notice under section 92 CA to assessee to produce evidence for computation of ALP for computation of ALP. Are we clear? 
and the a, a, tpo can also decide any other transaction which comes to the notice of the tpo during the course of proceedings before him are we clear so then in that particular case the tpo will call for the transfer pricing audit report or the tpo may call for any other evidence the documentation which the assessee has maintained to determine the arms length price are we getting that if the assessee has not furnished the transfer pricing report then in that particular case the provisions of this chapter will apply the assessment provisions will apply as or the transfer pricing provisions will apply as if the assessee has entered into international transaction so in that case the tpo will calculate the arms length price now based on the evidence collected based on the evidence gathered the tpo will determine the arms length price tpo to determine alp now the then the tpo will determine the alp are we clear and send the copy of his order to the assessing officer as well as to the assessee are we clear so on the seat of the order from the tpo the ao will proceed to compute the total income after considering the arms length price determined by the tpo and pass the order ao to consider the alp determined by the tpo and pass final order and pass the final order. so this will happen from the reference made by au to the uh, technical unit so technical units order which will come that will now form part of the au will consider that alp and will pass the final assessment order either under 143 or 147 then with 143 are we clear yes or no yes so this is how the transfer pricing assessment works now this order which is passed by the a this order if you remember you i told you that you the au will first send the income or loss determination proposal to the nfac the au will send the income or loss determination proposal to the nfac in case there are no variations which are proposed to the assessee's income right and in that particular case what will happen if there are no additions which are proposed so income or loss determination proposal will be given when no variation prejudicial to the assessee is proposed then the assessment unit will prepare this income or loss determination proposal and share it to the nfac <coughs> yes and nfac on receipt of that income or loss determination proposal will decide that whether the assessment order shall be passed and will convey to the assessment unit to pass the draft assessment order are we clear so au will then prepare the draft assessment order and then will send the draft order to the nfac and then again the nfac will say that okay now pass the final assessment order are we clear in case there are variations which are prejudicial to the assessee are proposed then the au will send the show cause notice and the assessee has to reply to that show cause notice and based on the reply of the show cause notice the income or loss determination proposal will be prepared and then again the au will say that this is the income or loss determination proposal 
and after that the AU will prepare the draft order. Now in case of the transfer pricing cases, the final assessment order is not passed. Only the assessment will stop at the draft assessment order. Are we clear? This draft order, you can just write down here, instead of final order, you can write AO to consider the ALP determined by AO, TPO and pass or you can write here and prepare and send the show cost notice to the assessee through NFAC. Fine. This AO will be the AU only, right? Then, based on reply of assessee, prepare the income or loss determination proposal and share to NFAC. NFAC to direct to AU to pass draft assessment order. Now this draft assessment order, then the AU will prepare the draft assessment order. Now where the draft assessment order is prepared, here the final assessment order will not be prepared. In rest of the cases, you can write here, in normal assessment, after the draft assessment order, NFAC directs AU to prepare final assessment order and shares to assessee. Here, the AU will prepare the draft assessment order and then the NFAC will Give this draft order to the SSC. In the transfer pricing cases, in TP cases, draft assessment order is shared to SSC. Now, SSC has two options over here. SSC can file the acceptance SSC can file the acceptance and based on the acceptance received from the SSC the NFAC will intimate to the AU to prepare the final assessment order Intimate AU to prepare final assessment order. To prepare the final assessment order. Now, this assessment order will be passed within 30 days. Within 30 days, or you can sorry write within one month from 
within one month from the month in which acceptance is received from assessi okay so assessi can file the acceptance within 30 days of order receipt of order and nfsc then will intimate to ao to file uh, prepare the final assessment order within one month from the month in which acceptance is received from the assessi the second option that the assc has is to file objections before the dispute resolution panel is to file the objections before the dispute resolution panel within 30 days under section 144c under 144c now in case the assc files the objections with the drp then nfsc will intimate the same to the assessment unit that the assc has gone to the drp are we clear now what is this dispute resolution panel under 144c a panel is constituted which is called as dispute resolution panel this is in the case of a company a person in whose the in uh, a person to whom the transfer pricing is applicable where the transfer pricing order is passed or in the case of any non resident company now when the objections are filed to the dispute resolution panel this is a panel of again the income tax officers this dispute resolution panel is a panel of the income tax officer this is an alternate remedy to the cit appeal the drp has three principal commissioner of the income tax so drp is three pcits or cits it's a collegium of three pcits or cits are we getting that now here the case will be decided by drp the case will be decided by the drp and the drp will then issue the directions the drp will issue the directions so it's basically like a cit appeal where the hearing will happen you will file the objections the evidence will be furnished by the assc report of the ao will be called so the drp will file that it will give the directions the directions may be to enhance or reduce or confirm the variations proposed confirm the variations proposed in the draft order in the draft order are we clear so drp will decide the matter which is in the draft order now this directions will be issued within Nine months, so it's a very time-bound process. Unlike CIT appeals, which takes maybe more than one year because it's a directory time limit to CIT. It's not mandatory. So CIT can take more than one year also. It can take three years. It can take four years. But this has to be issued within nine months from the receipt of the draft order. so it's a very time bound process but as i said cit appeal is not always pro revenue whereas here also if you look at this is like revision under 264 where the revision was decided by the revenue officers the 
superior officers here also drp has only the superior revenue officers so even drp is pro revenue now once the drp issue the directions against the order of the cita against the order of the cita appeal can be filed by the department whereas against the order of the drp against the directions of the drp the revenue cannot file appeal so the directions of drp are binding on the ao appeal cannot be filed by the ao the ao has to be bound by that because it's passed by its superior authorities only right so the ao has to be bound by that now once the directions of the drp comes then the on the receipt of the drp directions the nfac will forward the directions to the au and the au will complete the assessment au has to complete the assessment incorporating the drp directions drp directions so incorporating the drp directions the au has to complete the assessment there's no option to them they cannot appeal against the same and they have to do that within one month from the month in which directions are received and au shall then pass final assessment order which shall then be communicated to assess now again this order appeal before ITAT. This cannot be appealed before CITA. This can be appealed before ITAT. Whereas this order against which the SSC has given the acceptance, so within one month from the acceptance is received by the SSC, AU shall prepare final assessment order. And against this order, CIT appeals can be filed. So, if you are not going to DRP, you can file the CIT appeal. Give your acceptance to the draft order and take the final order. Go to CIT appeal. Second option is go to DRP, take the draft order. Don't file the acceptance. Go to DRP based on the DRP directions. You go to IT. So, basically, why do people use DRP? It's just a fast track route to go to IT. If you go to CIT appeal, it is going to take four or five years to go to IT. If you go to DRP within nine months, even DRP will mostly give the uh, order in the favor of the revenue. You can directly go to IT. You know that you have higher chances of winning in IT. It's a fast track route to go to IT. Yes, students, is it clear? Yes or no? Yes, the SSC can file the appeal before the tribunal delete. Yes. So this DRP is in the case of eligible SSC. This is eligible SSC, which is where EP your passes order or non-resident or the foreign company. Okay, this is in the case of eligible SSC. Fine. Now the last option which the SSC has is dispute resolution committee. 
the dispute resolution committee has been put up in place of the settlement commission in place of the settlement commission the dispute resolution committee has come up are you getting that One second, students. Yes. So, in place of the uh, settlement commission, the dispute resolution committee has come up. So, basically, the dispute resolution committee, which is there, is a kind of settlement of disputes in smaller cases. Now, what is this dispute resolution committee? So, dispute resolution committee, again, just write down, has two members which are retired IRS officers. Plus one PCCIT or CIT. One PCIT or CIT. So this is how the dispute resolution committee is formed. It's formed with the three members. Fine. Now, in this particular case, who can apply for the dispute resolution committee? That is the first question that one needs to ask. So, in case of the dispute resolution committee students, here the order which can be given to the dispute resolution committee, it's the specified orders, the orders which are covered. So, what are the specified orders? Just write down where What are the specified orders over here? The specified order which can be sub submitted for the dispute resolution committee. So application for the uh, resolution of dispute before the DRC has to be given. In respect of the specified order. So specified order means draft order under section draft order in case of eligible RC under 144C. So, which is in the case of transfer pricing cases. Right? In the case of transfer pricing cases, the draft order which is there. Secondly, <coughs> transfer pricing cases or in the case of a non-resident which is there. You can write non-corporate non-resident. Here foreign company cannot be covered. Of course, if it's a transfer pricing case, foreign company is also covered, but other than transfer pricing case. Intimation under section 143.1. Intimation under 143.1. TDS or TCS intimation under section 208. Or 206 CB1. Right? Then the assessment or re assessment order. The assessment or re assessment order. 
except the order past incorporating directions of the dispute resolution panel rectification order under 154 rectification order under 154 and order under section order treating tds deduct order treating deductor or collector as a cc in default tax deductor or collector as a cc in default okay for not deducting or paying the taxes so these are the orders which are covered which are covered under the dispute resolution committee drc draft order so draft order meaning before you go to the drb final assessment orders intimation rectification or the orders treating the assc as assc in default all these cases are there and what are the conditions over here there are con conditions which are given over here so what are the condition here one of the condition is that in case of this the variations proposed so the conditions are for these orders here they are saying that that the variation proposed should not exceed rupees 10 lakh variations proposed or made less than equal to rupees 10 lakhs and the return has been furnished by the assc return has been furnished by the assc so see here the order under 144 best judgment assessment is not covered because it requires the return to be furnished by the assc total income less than equal to rupees 50 lakhs total income less than equal to rupees 50 lakh what is not covered over here is search or orders passed orders passed based on search under 132 search initiated under 132 or requisition made under 132a survey conducted under 133a or information received under DTWA. So if the order is based on that, that is not covered. Plus, the applicant should not be person The applicant should not be a person 
in respect of whom in respect of whom the coffee posa act is coffee posa is initiated or there is an order of detention coffee posa detention has been made coffee posa is conservation of foreign exchange and prevention of smuggling activities act or in respect of whom prosecution for offense under indian penal code or narcotics act or benami transaction act or pmla is initiated pmla benami transaction is initiated or has been convicted has been instituted in the respect of whom prosecution has been initiated under the provisions of income tax act prosecution initiated under income tax act so it should not be this kind of assessy or the black money proceedings have not been initiated proceedings under black money law not initiated so i written the spelling wrong initiated okay now who is a specified person who is a specified person over here who fulfills the conditions over here that the total income is less than 50 lakh and additions are less than rupees 10 lakh and it is not covered under any of these prosecutions now what is the time limit for filing the application the time limit for filing the application is in case the appeal has already been filed and is pending before the cit so in that case the uh, uh, application can be filed within the time from the date of constitution of the di uh, dispute resolution committee at any point of time or within one month from the date of receipt of the order now how the application will be decided so in this case the application will be decided here first on the basis of the screening of application by the drc so first the time limit is one month from receipt of order time limit for application then drc will examine the application drc will examine the application that whether the applicant fulfills the criteria of the application or not and if he wants to reject it he will issue a show cause notice as to why the application should not be rejected or why the application should be accepted and based on the reply of the assc the drc will decide whether to accept or reject the application and accept or reject after issuing the show cause notice to assc and considering his reply fine this is the first day and then the drc if he allows for the application 
so within 30 days of the receipt of the communication that the application is admitted the assessee has to withdraw the appeal before the cita or drb on acceptance of application within 30 days assessee has to withdraw appeal before the CITA or the application before DRP because it cannot do a forum shopping. It can any choose any one forum. Right? Now what will the procedure will be followed by DRC? So procedure by the dispute resolution committee. It will call for records from the assessee. And it will call for report from the AO also. Okay. And will call any further information as it may require. And then after considering the information that it has, the evidence it has received, DRC will Pass the order. Now its order can be making the modifications to the variations in the specified order. Either making the modifications. So it can make the modifications which are not prejudicial to the interest of the SSC. And decide for waiver of penalty and immunity from the prosecution. Which are not prejudicial to the assessee. Plus give the waiver of. It may waive penalty or the prosecution. Fine. It can decide not to make any modifications. So confirm the order. It can just confirm the order. However, it may decide to waive the penalty and grant the immunity from prosecution. It can just confirm the order and it can waive the penalty or the prosecutions. Okay. And it will pass the order within six months from the month in which the application is admitted. So the RC will pass the order within six months from admission of application. So if you see even the DRC is a very very time bound process. The DRC is also a very very time bound process. Are we clear? So this has to be passed within six months and it will serve the copy of the order to the AO and to the associate. No appeal or reference will lie against this particular modified order. Are we clear? So, no appeal or DRP possible against, against modified order of DRC. So this will be the final order. Are we clear? And then the then the AO will of course serve the 
modified order along with the notice of demand to the assessee and assessee has to furnish the proof of payment of demand okay so ao will serve modified order to the assessee along with notice of demand under 156 and then assessee to pay the demand assessee has to pay the tax demand and on receipt of the demand on this on the confirmation of the payment of demand only then the drc will grant the immunity from prosecution and waiver of penalty so this is very important on receipt of confirmation of payment of tax demand by SSC DRC will grant immunity from prosecution or waiver of penalty. So the waiver of the penalty or prosecution will only be granted on the payment of the tax demand. Are we clear? So DRC has the power to reduce or waive any penalty or prosecution. So as I told you, it operates like the settlement commission. So what is the condition? That the assessee has paid the tax and has cooperated with the DRC. And then the prosecution proceedings should not have been initiated before the application made to the DRC. Are we clear? So just write down. So, waiver of waiver of penalty or immunity from prosecution shall be granted on payment of tax on the returned income Secondly, cooperation in of SSC in proceedings. Okay. If prosecution initiated before filing of application. immunity cannot be granted. So the prosecutions should not have been initiated before the application is being made. Are we clear? And then only the SSC will have the opportunity to go for this DRC. Otherwise it cannot get the immunity from the prosecution. Are we clear? And how, when the AO has to pass the order, so upon receipt of the order of the DRC under this section, the AO shall, in a case where the draft order is passed, pass a final assessment order or in the case where the final assessment order is passed, pass a modified order within a period of one month from the month in which order is received. So AO will serve the modified order to the SSC along with the notice of demand. This is within one month. This is within one month from receipt of order.
Yes, students. And in case the assessee fails to cooperate, assessee does not submit any information or has concealed any material thing or fails to pay the tax, the DRC proceedings will terminate. So, proceedings before DRC shall terminate if Assessee does not cooperate, fails to cooperate, conceals the facts, does not submit information, or conceal any material fact. Or fails to pay tax demand. Yes, students, is this clear? So, the leap in the search cases whether the assistant can approach DRC, the answer is no. In search cases, you cannot approach the DRC. Here, it is not possible. Under DRC, whether ITIT appeal is also not possible? No, it is not possible. Under DRC, even the ITH uh, is not possible. Because this is not a order which is appealable. This is under 245 MA. Yes, under DRC, only SSC has the option to initiate DRC because it's like a settlement commission to gain the immunity from penalty and prosecution. Then. Okay, students, so with this, we are closing the appeal topic. In the next class, we will be starting up with the penalties. Okay, students. So, thank you so much. See you in the next class. We can stop the lecture.